Right then, let's get started. Uh, this is a talk on microservices, um, why you might want to, to use a microservices, uh, some common pitfalls that you might encounter, and some techniques that you can use to, to avoid those problems. Um, the talk's broadly split into two sections. In the first, I'll be going over some of the, the problems I've encountered with microservices and sort of service oriented architecture. Um, in the second section, I'm going to demonstrate a slightly different approach to what you might have come across before to doing microservices, which helps you to alleviate some of the problems that actually occur in the, the first part of the talk. Um, but before we get into either of these, let's take a quick look at what we actually mean by microservices and why you might want to consider them as an architecture for your, your application. Okay, so. On the left here, we've got what you might refer to as a, a monolith. Um, you've got a big single code base, probably a single data store. Um, and then on the right, as a contrast, something that looks more like a microservice architecture, where you might have multiple different code bases, multiple different data stores, and probably some sort of front end application which, which ties everything together. Um, so, so your users are still presented with a, a single unified system. Um, so, one well, of the key features when you come to a monolith architecture um, is it's a single application containing multiple different business functions. Okay? In general, an organization will probably just have a single massive monolith, which is there, they're sort of, it, it covers all, all of the IT needs for the, the organization. Um, a monolith is also often seen as a, a derogatory term. Um, some legacy software which has maybe a bad design or is based on sort of outdated methods. But it, that doesn't have to be true. It's perfectly possible to build a good application using a monolith architecture. And it, it, it's a perfectly acceptable route to go down if, if that is the best choice for you. Um, another key point about a monolith is when you deploy it to your, your production infrastructure, or if you need to scale it up, it's done as a whole thing. That means that you'll generally have to replicate the entire application stack if you want to sort of make a staging environment or anything like that. Um, when it comes to, to a release, you're going to have to take the, the stack down and, and replace the entire thing in one go. Um, equally, if you have a, a burst of traffic, you generally can't just scale up the part of the application that's, that's under the most load you'll have to scale up the whole, the whole thing. Uh, this is less of a problem with PHP, as PHP applications are reinitialized on every request. But with a, a Java application, for example, you'd have maybe a really large application load into memory at all times, which means that you need a really large server to run it on. And if you need to scale that, you need another really large server, which can make scaling quite costly. Um, a monolith will generally be built on a, a single technology stack. Um, that could be quite a broad stack, taking into account a couple of different data stores, perhaps Elastic and MySQL or, or, or things like that, um, and have both PHP and JavaScript code sort of mixed in together. But you'll generally find that it limits itself to, for example, just one PHP framework. Um, and if, if that doesn't suit your needs anymore, you're kind of stuck with it. On the other hand, microservices. A microservice should have just a single business responsibility. It should do one thing and one thing well. Um, consider the, the Unix philosophy of having lots of tools that you can combine together to do more complex tasks. The same approach is, is kind of what you're thinking about when you're, when you're designing a microservice architecture. Um, your responsibility assigned to a microservice could be quite broad. It could handle all of your user data, for example, or, or shipping functionalities. Um, it, it could provide um, or just a standardized, standalone piece of functionality, like, for example, um, an address lookup service might be a good candidate for a, a microservice. One of the key things it should do, though, is it should have full authority over that area of responsibility. If it's managing users, it shouldn't be having to go off to other microservices to find out information about users. It should know everything about users. 
Microservice should be should be independent. Okay. Um, there's several ways in which it should be independent. You should be able to deploy it separately to all your other microservices. Okay. So if if, if you're making a code change to one, you should just be able to deploy that on its own. You should be able to scale it up separately as well. So if you get a burst of user registrations following a successful TV advertising campaign, you should just be able to scale up your registration service and have that cope with the additional traffic. Without, um, another way it should be independent is that you should be able to change the inner workings of your microservice without having to change other microservices. So if you want to completely rewrite a microservice in Go, providing you provide the same external API, you shouldn't have to change any of your other microservices. Okay. Um, microservice should have a, a dedicated API, a defined API. They're always a component in a larger system, so that it's really important that each one defines uh, an API through which other services can, can use that microservice. Our industry is quite keen on having like REST APIs over HTTP. Um, but don't feel that you should be constrained to this. RPC API style APIs are just as useful. Um, or even consider a microservice that accepts syslog formatted packets on a particular port. Um, that's still exposing a very useful API if what that microservice's responsibility is, is log aggregation. Okay? So an API doesn't have to be confined to just REST. Um, Another thing which is a contrast to other forms of sort of service oriented architecture is that microservices have the concept of smart endpoints and dumb pipes. That means that the, the sort of connectivity between all your microservices should pretty much just handle with get a message to that microservice. You shouldn't have business logic embedded in your, your sort of transfers between microservices. Um, all your sort of business logic should be built into the microservice itself. Some of the advantages of microservices. Um, probably the first advantage that people, people sort of talk about is it helps you improve the modularization of your code. Um, microservices by their nature cause you to have to split up functionality into, into different sections. Um, and that gives you a good opportunity to make sure that the, the, the code is very self-contained and and not coupled to other microservices. Um, microservice architecture allows you to vary the technology stacks on which you base your application and choose the best job for whatever your, your microservice is doing. Um, this could mean a lot of different things depending on, on the organization. Most common change that I've come across is someone deciding that for a particular microservice, a different data store was more appropriate. So they chose MongoDB over MySQL. Um, the more adventurous might even start to combine different frameworks or even different programming languages into the mix. If you've got something that's very data heavy, um, using a, a language that's a little bit lower level like Go or C could get you a performance boost. Um, and you can still have that interoperate with all your other microservices written in PHP. Um, that allows you to take advantage of different, the strengths in different programming languages and produce a much stronger whole. Um, probably the advantage that provides the greatest benefit is that each of your microservices can be deployed and scaled separately. Um, this, this sort of helps you um, if you've got certain hotspots in your application which require a lot more resources. You can scale up just that microservice so that it can cope with the, the higher processing demands that it, it encounters. As I, as I previously mentioned, it's less of an issue in PHP, but it's still a useful tool to have available to you. Um, smaller code bases is a, another advantage. Each microservice only has a small functionality, so a code base is much easier for, for someone who's new to the organization to, to get to grips with and to sort of become productive in it much faster. Um, obviously, additionally, with a smaller code base, it's much easier to justify the cost of throwing the whole microservice away if you've decided that you've gone completely down the wrong path with it and you want to just sort of rewrite it from the ground up using a, a, a different framework or, or a different technology um, that, that might be more appropriate to that microservice. Some of the, the disadvantages then, um, so of course there are, there are downsides 
to microservices as well. Um, availability is a, a problem that you're going to have to think about. If you've got a, a monolith application and as a company you can manage to have 99.7% uptime on that, that monolith. That's about one day's downtime accumulated across the whole year. What happens when you have 10 microservices which all have 99.7% availability? Well, unfortunately, it works out that you end up with a total of 10 days downtime where um, some of your system might not be available in the worst case, which means your entire system only has a 97% uptime as a whole. So you have to be a lot more careful about handling, um, handling failures in your microservices so that if, if one goes down, that doesn't bring your entire application to a, a grinding halt and you can sort of cope with a bit of an outage on, on one and the other nine can continue, continue doing their jobs. Um, another disadvantage is knowledge siloing. So if you've always got one developer who's responsible for the user's microservice, they become an expert in how that microservice works. If they then um, go on to leave the company, a lot of knowledge walks out the door. And because they were always the go-to expert for that microservice, they always picked up the tickets responding to that because they knew the code base really well and could do things really quickly. Um, you might not have anybody else in your company who really, really knows how that user's microservice works. Um, so it's quite important when you're using microservices to try and keep developers moving between several different microservices and make sure that each developer has knowledge in several different areas and each of your microservices is, uh, it's possible for several different developers to, to work on that microservice. Um, another disadvantage, um, you've probably seen quite a lot of GIFs and things floating around Twitter with like unit tests and integration tests missing, but testing um, a microservice system as a whole is, is quite a difficult concept because you, you could have a, a build that goes green um, with with one microservice, you deploy that out live, and it's, it's it breaks some other microservice because of a change that you've made. Okay, so you're going to have to think about how you can test not just a single service is working properly, but how you can test that the entire application system as a whole is working properly. Um, orchestration of the system is much harder with microservices. If you've got a single monolith, you've got to install PHP, MySQL somewhere. Okay, you can deploy that out to a server. It's quite straightforward. But on the other hand, a microservice architecture has a lot more moving parts. You've got lots of different requirements for your different microservices. You might need different extensions installed, for example. Um, so you, you're possibly going to have several different server configurations that you need to you need to manage. Um, and you also have to do things like ensuring that each microservice knows where to find other ones. If it needs to make a call out, it needs to know how to get to it. You need to manage things like log aggregation so that you're not having to sort of SSH into each individual microservice when you're trying to debug a live issue. Um, handling things like backups becomes a little bit more complicated because you've got 10 different data stores that you need to back up. Okay? You'll find there's tools like Chef and, and Ansible and all these sort of orchestration tools absolutely indispensable if you're, if you're going down the microservices route. Um, you might also consider tools like Docker as well, which are sort of coming out, which, which can help with these. One thing I've not really touched upon yet is the, the idea of a distributed monolith. It's in the title. So the distributed monolith is a term which I'm sort of using to describe a system which initially looks like a microservice architecture. You've got lots of separate code bases, lots of separate deploys. But it's actually a monolith in disguise. Um, what's so wrong with that is that you generally end up picking up the disadvantages of both architectures, but having the advantages of neither of them. Um, so the, the next sort of section is going to look at a few of the warning signs that you might actually be moving towards this distributed monolith rather than a, a true microservice architecture. Um, don't panic. Okay, uh, you might feel after listening to the section of the talk that microservices are a hugely bad idea that you should never ever touch and, and go away from. Um, but thankfully, a lot of the issues that I'm sort of going to be going over in the next section weren't all in one system. 
Okay, <coughs> there's sort of different things I've picked up whilst working for a variety of different companies over over several years. Um, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, problem number one: the common library. Um, it's probably a mistake that I've seen the most often um, in service-oriented architecture and, and microservices. Um, so. Just, just to see how common this is. How, have you got, has anyone here got a common library in their code base right now? Hands up. Yep, there's definitely a few of you. Okay, so even in this room we've got quite a few people who've, who've maybe, maybe got this, this problem. Um, the reason it's such a common mistake is, is due to the way it comes about. Someone thinks it's a really sensible idea to have a library which contains a load of shared code between your microservices. The idea is that it will speed up development and keep things consistent. Um, this library ends up growing over time. Whenever someone writes something that they need to share, they'll add it to the common library because that's where you put shared code. Right? Um, the effects, the bad effects of the common library also take quite a long time to become apparent. They sort of sneak up on you slowly. Um, what originally helped to speed up your development now slows it down and becomes quite a lot of work to, to sort of resolve. Um, it, it can be quite bad because um, when you start to build up a body of code, microservices start to lose their independence from each other. It initially starts to exhibit itself as a minor inconvenience when you're implementing a feature for a microservice and you have to first change something in the common library, get that all merged. It means two editor windows open, going back and forth between things. Um, but the pain of the common library really becomes apparent when you make a change in it. You deploy out the microservice that relies on that change. Everything's working. It's all green. It's all fine. And then a week later, you deploy out an unrelated microservice and it all breaks because it's pulled in the latest version of your common library and it wasn't expecting the change that you made. And things like that are quite, quite difficult to manage sometimes. Um, the common library becomes really huge. It becomes a dumping ground for all the shared code, even if it's just shared by two of your microservices out of ten, maybe. Um, your small, lightweight microservices might have very little code in them themselves, but this huge common library becomes bloated with all those shared functions, and you sort of lose the, uh, the advantages of having that small code base. Um, it changes really fast. It becomes unstable. Because you've got so much code in there, versioning goes out the window, and Instead, uh, instead of having proper dependencies like version 1 of your common library, you just end up depending on dev master because almost every ticket you work on requires a change in the common library. Um, it reduces the reliability of your builds and makes development workflows using Composer quite awkward. Um, it discourages technological diversity. Once you've built up this huge library of code on which all your microservices are based, the perceived cost of bringing in a new language or even a different framework looks huge. Because you're, you're looking at that code base and thinking, well, if I wanted to write a service in Java, I'm going to have to rewrite that entire common library in Java so that I can write my service. Which is kind of a false impression because probably you only need one or two of the functions in that common library. Um, that sort of acts as an artificial barrier to adopting new technology for, for microservices. So what can we do about it? Well, instead of creating a common library filled with everything under the sun, try and stick with smaller focus libraries containing just a single piece of shared functionality. The smaller libraries change far less often, and you can use semantic versioning to help manage breakages. Um, smaller focus libraries will be much easier to port or reuse should you choose to use a different language or technology stack. Um, and you'll only need to move the ones that, that you actually need. You may find that this sort of worsens the multiple pull requests problem. However, with smaller focus libraries, it's easier to sort of do the change that you need in the library first, manage that as a single ticket through your, your board, and only after you've, you've made that change, tagged a new version, do you pick up the ticket to implement the, the, the feature in the dependent microservice. Um, once you've got these smaller focus libraries, make sure that you're only including the libraries that a microservice needs. Don't just automatically copy and paste every common library into your composer JSON. Only pick the ones that you need. Um, this reduces the bloat, reduces your build times, um, and gets rid of unexpected surprises. Um, 
Some of you might be listening to this and wondering, how on earth do you manage all of these libraries? Well, Composer's quite a good tool for managing the problem. Um, you can lock the dependencies down for each microservice, um, so you can always repeat your build. Um, and you can also use various of the tools that Composer provides, like Satis, Tor and Proxy, or even the, the private packagist um, to be able to manage your own internal packages if you, if you want to. Um, sometimes, um, I know it's against every programmer's basic instincts, but sometimes you just need to copy and paste code. Okay? Um, this, this is probably most relevant if you've got something like a, an abstract controller. It might start off looking the same, but if you copy and paste that to your next microservice, each copy can evolve separately and independently of each other without you having to worry about breaking code in the microservices. Okay, so moving on. Another of the common pitfalls microservices tend to get into is a situation whereby you need to end up synchronizing deployments of multiple microservices. I've come across several sort of instances where this problem has occurred, and it's one that can have a huge scale of how much pain it can cause. On the one end of the scale, um, a front end deployment was delayed because the back end API wasn't ready yet, and the front end didn't work without the change in the back end. So we had to wait a few days for that to be finished before we could, we could deploy the front end again. Um, on the other end of the scale, a company that I work with had a development environment which required each of the microservices to be spun up in a particular order um, and to do all its setup process before moving on to the next one in order to get the development environment to work. Add to that problem was the fact that none of this was documented. So it took about a week to get a working development environment when you started that company, which is a complete waste of everyone's time. Um, we, we sort of documented that and made the process a little bit better, but they were still interdependent. I suppose probably the best way to demonstrate this problem is visually. Imagine for a moment you've got a monolith and you're doing a deployment. Even if the deployment becomes quite complex, it's quite easy to sort of keep track of what's going on. Now, imagine instead that maybe you've got a load of microservices okay, that you're trying to deploy and they're all interdependent and you've got to get them all out at the same time. You've got a lot more things that you have to keep track of and keep your eye on the ball. Um, if that's not bad enough, consider it's three in the morning, you're on call, and there's an emergency release that you need to do to fix a production issue. That's like juggling with those balls, but they're on fire. Okay? Um, it's not something you really want to be doing at three in the morning. Um, as I hope that, that demonstration sort of illustrated, each deployment that you, you do simultaneously um, gives you a lot more that you need to concentrate on. Um, it increases the risk of that deployment and increases the problems that you'll have if you need to, to, to roll back or anything like that. Um, with more to concentrate on, you're more likely to, to skip steps and, and miss things. For example, thoroughly testing your, your newly deployed services. If you've got to sort of rush on to deploying the next one, you're not going to have as much time to, to test your deployment when successfully. Probably the worst side effect of these interdependent deployments is rollbacks. Um, it's fairly easy if you deploy one service, it's the first one in the chain of 10 that you need to deploy, it breaks, you roll it back, it's fine. What if you get to the last one? Um, nine of them, you've managed to deploy out, they're all fine, the last one you deploy out and everything breaks. You need to roll it back, but you also need to roll back all the other ones that you've already deployed out to get back into a stable state. This is yet another instance where you're having to juggle multiple things at once and, and concentrate on, on getting everything right across your entire estate. So what's the solution? Probably the most obvious way to avoid this problem is versioning on your APIs. So the, the, way, the ways in which you communicate, you have several different versions, and that means that you can deploy out a new version, but leave the old version in place. Um, that, that means that all your existing services can continue using the old version until you had time to take your time and update those services to use the new API. Once you've done that, you can deploy out a code release that removes that deprecated API. Um, another thing, sometimes you'll have to make a breaking change to an API and it can't be avoided. 
um, in which case you'll find that feature flags can be quite helpful. Um, the idea is that you, you put a flag in your code that says enable this feature or disable this feature. You deploy and test it as normal with the feature flag turned off, so it still exhibits the old behavior. And then once you've sort of deployed out all your microservices, all the dependencies that depend on this, this new feature, this new change, you flip a switch and turn that flag on across your entire infrastructure, make sure it's all working with a new feature, and that, that sort of gives you a single one step to turn it on and off again. If it was working, you leave it on, it's all good. If it's not and you need to roll back, all you have to do is flip your feature back off. Okay. Um, the final tool that you have is automation. If you're in a situation where you absolutely cannot avoid simultaneously deploying a couple of microservices, the more automation you have around your deployments, the better. If you can just click a single button and it's deployed out, that's great. If you're having to SSH into each different server, pull a Docker container, spin it back up, do some database migrations, that's a lot, lot more steps, a lot more things that you can get wrong. Okay. Um, this really should be considered a last resort, though, if you can't sort of um, handle the problem using versioning or, or, or flags. So up until now, the features, the, the pitfalls I've described are fairly easy to, to manage. Okay, there's, 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 there's quite easy ways of, of sort of getting around them. Um, and with good tooling, you can sort of alleviate the pain that they will cause you. Um, both a common library and interdependent deployments are examples of coupling between microservices. However, temporal coupling is by far the most damaging. What exactly do I mean by this? Consider maybe a, a, a ticketing application, okay? A user wishes to purchase a ticket, they're, they're interacting with this front end. Um, so they submit a form of their card details and the number of tickets they want to buy. The server application on this front end then makes a REST call to the user service to check their login and retrieve user details. The ticket microservice to check that the tickets they want to buy are actually available. Uh, the fraud microservice to make sure their card hasn't been stolen or anything like that. Um, up to the payment microservice to take the payment for those tickets. Back to the ticket microservice to tell it that we've sold those tickets and they're no longer available. Um, off to the accounts to microservice um, to, to log the purchase and, and update your internal business systems. To the loyalty system to, to credit your, your customer with loyalty points. And to the email microservice, finally, to, to send a confirmation email out to your, your customer. That is, in all its glory, a huge distributed monolith. Okay? What makes that so bad? Well, as you can possibly imagine, with all those REST calls out to all those services, if you deploy something like that, the first thing you'll notice is it's really, really slow. All that kind of back and forth between all those modules. If you had that inside a monolith, you'd just be calling methods in a different class. You wouldn't notice the problem. In PHP, uh, a method call is measured in microseconds. Whereas, once you've got all those network calls going on inside your stack, it's measured in tens or even hundreds of milliseconds. That's a hundred thousand times slower. Okay? It tends to creep up on you quite slowly as your functionality grows. Each time you add a microservice, the entire system gets a little bit slower. Um, and it can get really bad. I was working on a project which, in order to render one page, made about 15 backend calls and consequently took about 20 seconds. Um, we, we refactored that down to one call and it rendered in half a second, which was much better. Um, obviously, services much must wait for a response. If they're making a REST call out to the ticket microservice to see if they're available, uh, it's got to wait for the service to come back and say, yes, yes they are, you can proceed with the purchase. Um, so just a single service failing in that stack means that you, you can't process a transaction. Okay? It brings your entire application, your entire ability to sell to your customers to a juddering halt. Um, what happens when someone fails? The number of failure scenarios grows exponentially with each additional service call. For example, at each stage, the business logic would fail. The tickets are sold out. Um, the customer didn't pass the fraud check. That, that's probably fairly easy to deal with. You know, you, you, you're you expecting that failure. Um, what about weird errors that you, you're not quite expecting? Uh, the service returning a 500 error 
Should you try that request again or should you abort? What if the connection times out? You don't know if the service received the message or not. Do you try again or not? Did the booking service allocate tickets that are now reserved and can't purchase by anyone else or did it not? Um, distributed transactions are really hard and you want to try and avoid them. If you get partway through that ticket booking transaction and you notice an error and you've got to roll it back because you've allocated some tickets and charged someone's card, um, that's a really difficult problem to solve because what happens if I say, well, okay, I've charged the card, I failed to, to sort of mark the tickets as sold, so I'm going to roll it all back. But then during the rollback, you can't reverse the payment, for example. That's, that's the kind of problem that you're having to try and deal with. It's really difficult to sort of get out of that failure cascade scenario. So to sum up that section, um, there's a sort of a common theme throughout the, those problems. There are examples of coupling between your microservices. Just like coupling to a, a framework, for example, can cause you development problems down the line, tight coupling between microservices is also a, a sort of a, a source of problems. Um, so if coupling between microservices is so bad, what should we do to avoid it? A few suggestions. Um, there's often a misconception around the term microservice and the application of the single responsibility principle to it. People take this to mean that a microservice should do only one thing, one very, very tiny focused thing. This leads to like microservices like address, invoice, which often consists of just a single domain model um, and a REST API. The trouble with the microservices that are too fine-grained is that when you're doing a single user action, it's often necessary to involve dozens of these transactions. You know, you need to save an address, so that goes off the address microservice, and then you need to link that address to an invoice, so that goes off the invoice microservice, so on and so forth. Um, it's perfectly acceptable for a microservice to have a fairly broad responsibility. Um, a user microservice should have be responsible for everything to do with a user. Um, you shouldn't need all the microservices to do actions on your user microservice. Any microservice that needs a user should just probably restore an, store an identifier to it. Um, there's nothing even wrong with a microservice exposing its own user interface. Your user microservice could, for example, hold all the registration forms and logic for resetting passwords and things like that. That's perfectly fine. Um, define clear boundaries. Uh, if you have a clear boundary between your microservice, the need for them to communicate with each other should diminish. Um, ideally, it should be possible for a single microservice to handle each, uh, a single user request should be handled by a single microservice. It won't always be possible, but the closer to this ideal that you are, the less problems you'll have with sort of the temporal coupling. Um, the boundaries can be quite hard to get right up front, which is another reason to start with fairly large microservices. It's much easier to break down a large service than it is to try and stitch several back together. Okay? Um, for anyone who's into a bit of domain-driven design, a good starting point is um, a bound of context for a microservice and then break down within that as required. Um, communicate asynchronously. Probably the best way to avoid that, that sort of ticket booking, booking mess is to, to communicate asynchronously between your microservices. Um, it requires a bit of a shift in thinking from REST, and it's what I'm going to sort of focus on in the, the, the second section of this talk. So, event-driven architecture, which is what we're going to be looking at now, is in brief the idea that instead of making REST calls to all the services, services instead exchange state and messages through events. For example, a ticket was purchased event. Does that sound familiar to anyone? You might recognize this idea, representing state as a sequence of events that happened from event sourcing. There was a talk on that earlier in the conference, I believe. The main difference from event sourcing and event-driven architecture is the scale. Event sourcing focuses on the state of a single model, whereas in event-driven architecture, we're concentrating on exchanging state between services at a higher level. 
it isn't necessary to use event sourcing in each microservice to take advantage of an event-driven architecture. Um, and even if you did, you wouldn't be just streaming every single event. You'd only be streaming events that represent an, an aggregated change that other services might be interested in. But it does sort of help to have a basic idea of, of what event sourcing is. Um, so quick recap. This might be a database EDR diagram for a, a shopping system where a customer has orders and various items that they've maybe added to their basket. We use a table to store each one and obviously when a, when a customer adds an item to their basket, we get a row in this table. When they remove it, we delete the row. Very straightforward. In contrast, this diagram represents more of an event source model for that, that sort of same system. Um, when a customer, his name's Tom, adds an item to his basket, we get an item added event. And when he adds another item, another item added event. When he removes one, instead of deleting a previous event, we just add another item, removed event, to the stream. Um, when he updates the quantity, we have a quantity updated event. And finally, we have a checkout event. Now, probably, if this was one of your microservices, the only event that you would bubble up to the, the system as a whole is that one. Because that's the point at which other microservices, say your shipping or your fraud microservice, might be interested. They might want to do something on that event. Your fraud microservice probably isn't interested that Tom's added an item to his basket. Probably doesn't need to know that. So, if we maybe take a look at that ticket booking application that we had before, um, and look at the system as a whole, we can see that each of the microservices we've got here um, is connected to sort of an event bus. Um, you could use RabbitMQ or Apache Kafka as a good choice for, for an event bus if, if you're implementing this thing. And whenever a microservice, say the user service takes a registration, um, and it knows of a change that another microservice, like the email service maybe, needs to know, um, it publishes an event to the event bus. And then, so we, we have a registration event that gets published to the event bus. The email service goes, well, I need to know about that. That's an email address. I need to send an email. So it'll listen to that event and it'll update its own internal state and say, I'm going to store the fact that this user ID has this email address. I'm going to send them a welcome email as well. I'm going to record that I've done it. But the key thing there is that email microservice has stored the data that it needs to be able to do its job from that event. It doesn't have to go off and query the user microservice every time it wants to send a, u a user an email because it's got it already. Okay. Um, in some instances, maybe the fraud microservice receives an event. It does some fraud checks and goes, oh dear, don't want to let that transaction go through. So it drops something on the, uh, the event bus and says, block that transaction. And it sends an email to the customer saying, sorry, your, your payment was declined. Um, and maybe probably sends a, an email to someone in your business to say, this transaction's been potentially flagged as fraudulent. What do you want to do about it? Um, so to make all this work together, there's a couple more concepts from the event sourcing world that we want to borrow. The first is a projection. The idea of a projection is it takes a stream of events, you remember that item added, item added, item removed, etc., and turns it back into state, something in our uh, database tables something that we can use, we can query, um, and, and things like that. A projection could be many different things. It could be a Rona MySQL database. It could be a MongoDB document. How you structure your projection depends on how you need to use it. Um, it needs to be able to recover after downtime. So if your microservice goes offline, even if maybe it's just offline for a couple of minutes while you do a deployment, or if it's down for a much longer time because you've, you've encountered a bug or a problem, um, you need to be able to catch up on the events and replay them through your project projection so that you've got the most recent and update state. Depending on the queue implementation, it might be able to do that for you. Apache Kafka can. Um, but otherwise, you might need to look into other options for sort of catching up with those events. Projections can be rebuilt. An important feature is that you can just throw away all the data in that projection and you can rebuild it from scratch using the data from the event stream. That can be quite useful if your business requirements change and you say, well, in addition to, to capturing that user's email, we want their first and last name as well so that we can greet them and say, hi, Tom, thanks for making your purchase. So you delete your 
your projection that's got your emails in, and you rerun that entire event stream, and this time you capture the email and the name. Um, when you're dealing with events coming from a remote service, of course, you're going to have to expose some sort of mechanism for replaying those events. Um, I'm going to go into more detail about that in a, in a moment. <clears throat> the second thing you're probably going to find yourself needing is a process manager. The idea of a process manager is that instead of just creating a, a, a read-only model, effectively, a process manager handles business logic that stems from an event. That could be as simple as sending an email to the accounts team when an invoice is raised for over a thousand pounds, or it could be a more complicated process which results in new events being published to the message bus. Um, the best way to think about a process manager is it's a state machine. Okay? Whenever it receives an event, it causes a transition into a new state. And then from that state, another event transitions into another one. Consider a, a referral scheme for your, for your company. Refer three friends and get a, get a £10 voucher. Um, you'd have a state machine that says, right, this customer has referred no friends. When you get a referral event on your bus, it transitions to state two, where they've referred one, then another one, and another one. And then finally, when you get to the final state, it says, right, you referred your three friends, publish an event that says this customer has earned their loyalty voucher, and then your account microservice can pick that up and go, oh, great, I'll credit their account with £10. Obviously, that's quite a simple example. You might have much more complicated examples. For example, shipping an order and handling all the, the various bits of logic that it needs to go through to, to handle that shipping. Be careful with replays with process managers. A projection, it's quite easy. You delete all your data, you replay all your events through it, you get the same state at the output, hopefully. Process managers trigger changes in other areas. So if you replay a whole stream of events through a process manager, you'll end up crediting your customers' accounts for that £10 voucher all over again, which is probably not what you want to do. Um, so it, you have to put a lot of thought into making them safe to replay. Most people probably want to just avoid replaying them at all. Okay? Just accept the fact that they've, they've happened. Event replays. Probably the best way of handling it is not by publishing the event back to the bus. Um, each microservice have it implement a, an endpoint that says get events. Okay? And then each service, so this loyalty service, keeps a checkpoint on each event. So you, you number the events coming from each service, one, two, three, four, five. And the loyalty service says, well, I've processed up to event 75. At the point at which your loyalty microservice goes offline for a while, because you're, you're doing a big upgrade, it stores that 75. When it comes back online, it goes off to the ticket microservice and says, hey, can you give me all the events that have happened since event 75? And then it can replay those. That could be part of your deployment process. Brings itself back up to the current state and then starts listening for new events on the event bus. Obviously, when you, you need to replay events, all you do is forget your checkpoint. And you go back to that service and say, give me all the events since event zero so I can replay them through my, my system. Um, that's basically one way of doing it. So, some of the advantages of these event-driven architectures. Probably the, the key advantage to the event-based pattern is that the microservices become decoupled. Um, they can fo focus on performing their role, telling others about what they've done, but not relying on the microservices to be able to perform their job. Such a system allows for small amounts of downtime in your microservices without affecting the overall system functionality. Um, if your email microservice goes down, for example, you've just got a bit of a delay sending emails out to your, your customers. And once it comes back online, it'll catch up. Um, another advantage is it scales really well. Um, if you get spikes of activities, all you do is get a backlog of events on your queue, which once the activity peters off again, your service just sits there churning through, churning through, and, and, and catches up. Um, Another thing is if you have to add a brand new service, you don't have to worry about scaling any others. They're just another listener. So if, if you um, add, a, a, add another service onto the bus that's recording all the ticket sales to, to, com, uh, to sort of produce a report for your business, for example, um, 
you're not impacting the capacity to serve requests to your users of any of your other microservices. They're easier to change. Following on from that previous point, if at some point you need to add a new feature to the system, for example, auditing all the transactions over a certain amount for a, a legal requirement that's come in, for example, it's possible to do so without changing any of your microservices that you've currently got. Um, in this instance, you'd simply add a new microservice and a new listener to that event bus and capture any transactions going through and apply the business logic. Do I need to audit this or not? In the REST model, you would at a minimum need to alter one service in order to have it send a notification to your new service whenever a transaction occurs. Or alternatively keep that log itself and, and build that business logic into that microservice. So it's a bit, that makes it much easier to sort of add new features completely separate from, from existing things. Uh, you don't get any distributed transactions. Um, handling rollbacks and failures becomes much simpler. In the event that you have a fraud transaction detected, you simply emit an event that says this is fraudulent and then your service can just react to it. Um, even in the worst case, for example, a payment fails after you've told your customer, yep, your transaction's been completed, you've been allocated the tickets, your payment microservice picks that event up and says, right, we'll charge that card, and it fails. Emit a payment failed event. What do you do with that? Well, one way would be to have the, the booking service just revert the tickets and say, well, yeah, they weren't sold, whoops. Um, but maybe a better way would be to have it alert a customer service representative who can then call the customer and say, very sorry, but your ticket booking, the payment failed. Can you provide me a different card? Um, or can you sort of contact your bank and, and sort it out? Um, that latter option is much better customer service and not likely to have loads of customers complaining on Twitter that the tickets that they booked never materialized. Um, there you go. So, some conclusions. We've taken a, a brief look at how microservices and monolithic architectures differ, why you might want to use both of them. Um, I've also covered some of the common mistakes that people make when implementing microservices and how you can avoid those mistakes. Finally, we took a look at how we can use asynchronous events um, between microservices to further the autonomy of a microservice. Uh, I'm now going to go through what I think are the, the sort of the key takeaways from this talk and the things that you need to consider if you decide to go down the microservices route yourselves. So every architectural decision that you make involves trade-offs. The important thing that I, I want you to take away from this talk is that you need to know what those trade-offs are and you need to make a conscious decision that the cost benefit to your, the problem that you're trying to solve is worth it. Okay? Some of these trade-offs are, are clearly worthwhile and can clearly help you deliver business value. Others may be made because when, when you're very close to a problem, um, you sort of you, you see a, a solution and you go, well, that's better than what we had before, so let's do that. But you may be not considering the, the bigger tr picture and it becomes much harder for people then to sort of change track once they've sort of gone down a rabbit hole and they've gone, well, we've done this and then we did this to solve that problem and then, you know, um, they're, they're quite pleased with the way they've solved the problem, but maybe there was a simpler, more elegant way of doing it. Um, the choice between monoliths and service-based architecture is, is no different. There's trade-offs and benefits to both approaches. You need to consider them and decide whether it's, it's a good fit for what you're trying to do. This is a point that bears repeating many, many times. Microservices are so named because they are micro in comparison to the monolith that they are replacing. It's not a judgment on the specific size of how big a microservice should be. It's always better to start off with a really big microservice and split it down as you learn more about the problem domain and you can make better decisions once you've learnt about that particular system about where those boundaries should be. Okay? If you've already got a monolith, that's an excellent place to start your microservice architecture from. Find a self-contained area of functionality, maybe it's an address lookup service, and break it out into a microservice. See how that goes, see how it improves your, your architecture. Once you've done that, find another area, break that off. Keep going until you've got a more microservice-based architecture and a, and a 
something looking more like what you're, you're after. Uh, favour autonomy over the single responsibility principle. Um, many of the problems you'll run into when building microservices comes from a high degree of interaction between those microservices. Um, this can come from overzealous enforcing of the single responsibility principle. Um, it can be a trade-off that's well worth making to put seemingly unrelated functionality into a microservice because it's the only microservices that make use of that functionality. Um, if you've got that address lookup service and it's only ever used by the user registration microservice, does it need to be a separate service? Answer, probably not yet. Okay. Remember, you can always break it out later if, if you determine that your invoicing service needs to use it. You can break it out, make a separate microservice further on down the line. Embrace eventual consistency. It's a bit of a controversial point, but if you build a microservice architecture, embracing eventual consistency is a great way to save yourself a lot of headaches. Um, the real world is eventually consistent. If you think about a warehouse, okay, you've got a, a, a software system that says, I've got 10 TVs in my warehouse. Turns out, someone's nicked one. How many TVs do you have? <coughs> nine. If you sell 10 TVs to customers, what are you going to do? You've only got nine. Generally, your business is going to have a way of dealing with that problem. So you've, you're already going to have a, prop, a, a system in place to deal with issues where you oversell your stock. So do you need microsecond accuracy on how many TVs you've got in stock? No, you do not. Don't forget that before we had computer systems, all business processes were eventually consistent. You'd have a piece of paper, it'd be in order. It'd say, customer wants to buy a TV. It'd go from sales to accounts, they'd take payment, then it'd go off to shipping, they'd, they'd ship it out, then it'd go back to the office to be filed away. All the time passing around and the system as a whole not worrying about it not being 100% consistent all the time. Each microservice should therefore maintain its own worldview. If it needs some data, it should keep it within its own data store so that it can reference that data. So it's got its own opinion on what the state, the current state of the system is. Um, and that, that way it's not having to, to go off to other systems and say, you know, what, what's the email address for this user? If it needs that email address to do its function, it saves it and updates it when it changes. Right, I, I hope everyone's found this talk interesting and, and, and learnt a few things. Um, I mean, there's not much of the conference left, but if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, that's great. If not, that's my Twitter handle, uh, my GitHub. I've got a few interesting projects on there. Um, you might want to check out. I've got a blog as well. There's a few bits and pieces on there you might be interested in having a read at. And finally, there's a joined in link if you want to rate the talk, give a bit of feedback. See what you liked and what you didn't like. That would be fantastic. Okay, so has anyone got any questions? We've got this like, nice little box thing that I can throw at you. Any questions? No, not at all. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>